Hello and welcome to Remote Pair Programming, Pair Programming for Remote Development Teams. Who am I? My name is Joe Moore. I work for Pivotal Labs. This is what I look like. I've been pair programming for over 11 years and during that time I've been remote pairing frequently for about six years and for the last year I've been remote pair programming full-time. That's eight hours a day, five days a week. But first, what is pair programming? Well, it's two developers coding on one workstation, solving one software problem. Pair programming has many benefits, higher code quality, fewer code defects, developer focus and intensity, a faster problem solving and knowledge transfer between those two developers, and also a continuous code review. For the purposes of this discussion, I'm not going to try to sell you on the concept of pair programming. Many of us believe in it, but the purposes of this talk is to acknowledge that there is this philosophy and this practice of pair programming, and we also have an ever-increasing number of remote developers out there in the world. So how do you apply this concept of pair programming to this remote development workforce? So with that, what is remote pair programming? There's no robots involved quite yet, but we're maybe only a few years away from that. Remote pair programming is just like regular pair programming, only not at the same physical computer. I think it's best to express this with some photos and some videos. So here's my remote pair programming setup. You see my computer, but that's actually a screen sharing session with a development machine 2,500 miles away from me. I have a speaker and a microphone and also a laptop which I use for my video conferencing session with my pair thousands of miles away. I'm going to get into the technology side a bit later, but uh, before we do, I want to talk a bit more about the, the people. That's coming up soon. Here's another photo of me. Here you can see my pair on the video conference a little bit better. also have some videos. This is a link to my blog. I'm going to show you a couple of those videos right now. Receive tracking events. A, B, C, D, E. Uh, I see. Okay. Um, and these tracking events are going to be the test tracking event. Um, it says it wants two, so I think you can actually um, hmm. probably just duplicate that one. Here is a view of that same screen sharing session immediately after the clip you just saw. To maybe not. Where did you put that? Uh, oh, do uh, to, to have um, it was not to receive request. Oh, oh, so that's not on ours. Ah, okay, okay. I hear. Can I uh, drive for a quick second? Yeah, yeah. Please. So I think it's actually not the gateway the way we wrote it anyway. It's the expected request. So why remote pair program? The shorter answer is that you get the same benefits from remote pairing as you do with in-person pair programming. Again, higher focus all the way to a continuous code review. I also believe that remote pair programming has many benefits that counter many of the, the downsides or the challenges that remote software developers complain about on a regular basis. I want to highlight some of those right now. Let's look at focus and intensity. Many remote developers complain that when they're not in an office environment, they lose that intensity, they lose that focus. Anything from uh, browsing the web, playing on Twitter, to changing the laundry or walking the dog. Uh, intensity, if you're not constantly working with somebody, uh, you might uh, not be as focused or intense on the work that you're working on. Uh, faster problem solving and knowledge transfer. Um, definitely easy to get into some sort of black holes of software development if you don't have anybody around to bounce ideas off of. Uh, knowledge transfer is definitely difficult when you're working by yourself. Uh, regarding knowledge transfer, definitely want to emphasize that silo is a four-letter four word. I think a lot of remote developers, uh, when they're given tasks to work on, uh, they might be given a certain functional area of uh, a piece of software and they might be the only people who work on that. I think the theme is that many people think, well, if this person is remote, then 
they might uh, then we need to give them something that they can work on completely by themselves uh, in total isolation because it's hard for them to you know communicate with other people or you know we don't want to have to rely on them because they're remote and you know who knows what they're doing out there I really want to challenge that I believe you can get a full uh, in-office experience and a full pair programming experience uh, complete with knowledge transfer and, uh, and uh, elimination of these silos uh, even with a remote workforce. Short answer, because you can. That's why you can, that's why you should remote pair program. Uh, the technology is there, uh, the people are there, and uh, there's really no reason why you shouldn't be doing it if you believe in pair programming. So how do you do remote pair programming? Want to really emphasize the people and hold off on the technology for now. With remote pair programming, you need really good pairing etiquette. This is things like not taking the mouse or the keyboard away uh, from your pair without them knowing it. Um, you might have a really good screen sharing session and also a really good uh, video conferencing session going with your pair, but you might not be able to see their hands. You might not be able to see those subtle little cues that let uh, each other know that you're ready for the other person to take over the keyboard or the mouse something that I'll often do is I'll say, hey, do you mind if I look at this? Or uh, I need to spend more time on this code. Do you mind if we stay here for a sec? Or, hey, do you mind if I show you something? I'm, gonna, I'm going to grab the mouse. Something I probably say a hundred times a day is, I'm going to grab the mouse. I'm going to grab the mouse. I'm going to grab the mouse. Just to let my pair know, hey, I'm going to be doing something here. And that way uh, their context isn't suddenly shifted away uh, by my hijacking the keyboard and mouse. Um, I find that both sides get into this habit pretty quickly and those subtle little cues that you need to sort of know what state your uh, pair is in, you know, are they paying attention, are they uh, ready for you to take over, you get pretty used to the uh, video versions of those cues and audio versions of those cues pretty quickly. You need a really good attitude. Uh, part and parcel with that is you need really generous understanding in office folks. Uh, you're going to have some problems. Technology is going to collapse. Um, you might have internet might go down. Uh, you might uh, have a bad uh, connection to your office or something like that. And you need people who are going to be able to help you out. A good operations department, good pairs, um, who realize, hey, remote pair programming is worth it. Yes, it's going to be a little bit more overhead, but it's still worth it. Uh, you want to be able to have fun. Uh, for example, on the spare monitor that my pair has been using for uh, our script, our video session, they started putting different backgrounds on that monitor and placing my video session on top of it. So here I am. I'm the king of England. Uh, then I shaved my beard, and now I'm the queen of England. But now I'm Michael Jordan, so I think I won in the end. As I mentioned before, you need a lot of patience. Uh, you're going to have a, perhaps a little bit of uh, lag uh, if you're the remote person, so your typing might not be quite as fast. Uh, on the other end of that, if you're the hosting the session, um, the pairing session, then you might be you need to be aware that your pair might have a little bit of lag. Uh, don't misconstrue uh, their being a bit slower than usual with uh, them being stuck or something like that. And by the way, you do need good technology. Remote pair programming definitely has some challenges. The number one challenges are the same challenges you have as in-person pair programming. Uh, one of the, the themes I'm really trying to promote here is that remote pairing is pretty much the same as in-person pairing. And if you get all these great benefits with in-person pairing uh, as you do with remote pairing, then you're going to have the same challenges as well. So if the person you're working with is a jerk, that person is going to be a jerk remotely too. If that person is a keyboard hog, or not a very uh, person, not a person who's very good with their pairing etiquette, they're probably going to have those same problems. Uh, the novelty of remote pairing quickly sort of fades away into the background, and the pairing sessions become just like regular pairing. So all the same benefits come with all the same problems. I really miss whiteboards. I have yet to find a digital solution, either a website or an iPad application or really anything uh, that's both affordable 
and helps me convey the ideas I need to as quickly uh, with my team as being able to, to, to jump up and just scribble something on a whiteboard. I don't have that opportunity anymore. What I find I often do will be to write something down on a note card and hold it up to the camera. You'd be surprised how often I have to do this and how well it works. Sure, you don't get both people being able to scribble their ideas down, but sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. If you have a remote team, uh, you likely have people working in multiple time zones. So two time zones is definitely hard. Three time zones is even harder. Uh, some of the challenges here are uh, deciding, uh, are you going to choose a time zone to be the quote unquote home time zone and force everybody to work in that time zone? Uh, so you might have a, uh, a Pacific time zone based project in California and you might have people working uh, in the Eastern time zone uh, on the East Coast. And if you decide that the project is going to be basically a West Coast project, then those East Coast people are going to have to work maybe instead of 9 to 6, they might be working from noon until 9 p.m. at night. Uh, that's definitely a challenge. If you decide that it's better for people to work in their own time zones, then you're going to have a lot of context switching as people come online and then go offline uh, as, they're, as they go throughout their day. You know, as they start their day, as they go out to lunch, and then as they end their, end their day, uh, you might find people jumping around from pair to pair, uh, figuring out how to best pair up uh, as the people sort of drop in and out of the, uh, in the project throughout the day. Mobile development for physical devices is a challenge as well. Uh, for example, you might be pairing with somebody on a phone application, and that phone application might need to be deployed on 10 different phones of, from 10 different makers. And as a remote person, you might not have all those devices. Your pair might say, oh, device X uh, looks really funny when we deploy our app to it, and you might not have it right there in front of you. Uh, so that's definitely a challenge. So there are ways of, of uh, sharing the applications that you're building for devices you know, across the network and such, but it's not quite the same as having you know, a whole suite of physical devices in front of you. Uh, here I have a video I'm going to show you of myself and my pair uh, debugging a particular issue on one phone uh, using the video camera. That was because, so here, let me see if I can, so I'm on the screen. Uh -huh. This is just the tag people screen, and then I back out of this. That's when it does it. Oh, okay, that makes sense. And so then I go to people, and I try to rotate, and it just doesn't, it never goes. Never does it. So this does behave the way we want it. That really is, I mean, I guess that's good. Many people ask me about meetings, stand-up meetings, uh, planning sessions, scrums, things like that. Um, how do I, as a remote person, a remote, remote pair, attend these, uh, these meetings? I find that as long as there's a, uh, you either in a, your pair is either in an, an office environment that has maybe uh, Skype-enabled computers in every meeting room, or if your pair is using a laptop for you, for your remote uh, uh, video session, then it's really not too bad. Uh, something that's really interesting is I find that if there's a dedicated laptop for the remote people in the office, then those dedicated laptops quickly become that the remote presence for that person. So my name's Joe. Uh, it's pretty quickly, the laptops that my pairs use become the remote Joe. Uh, people come up to that laptop, they talk to me, they ask me questions. If I need to attend a meeting, they unplug whatever happens to be plugged into that laptop, pick me, quote unquote, up, and take me into meeting rooms, uh, take me around the office, anything like that. Uh, my floating head on the screen quickly becomes me to the other people in the office. Uh, it's really great. Finally, the technology. There will be problems. This is really important to realize. This goes back to having a good attitude, having good in-office people, having some patience. There will always be technology breakdowns at some point. Uh, the internet will slow down. Your VPN will go down. Uh, no, no screen sharing uh, technology or video technology is perfect and just taking these things in stride is really important. If you're the personality type that uh, will get extremely angry at the smallest technical hiccup, this might not be for you. 
Uh, the first and most obvious is having a fast internet connection with really high upload bandwidth. Uh, if you are hosting a screen sharing session and video sessions, then you need to be able to push a lot of data up to your pair. Another thing to talk about with your operations department, if you are working with uh, in an office, that is a VPN. You need, need to be able to get through that firewall. Screen sharing is the heart and soul of remote pair programming. Uh, you can talk all you want on the phone, but you have to be able to see and edit the code. Um, there's many different cross-platform solutions and also uh, proprietary solutions. Uh, for example, iChat and ScreenSharing.app only work on Macs. Uh, Skype, TeamViewer, VNC work on all platforms. Um, we happen to be a Mac shop and in our experience, ScreenSharing.app, which is built into every Macintosh, is the, the best. It's the most solid, it crashes the least. Um, I've had it even survive reboots of the machine that I was remote, remoting into. Um, I find it's the fastest, it seems to be the best all around. If you're a minimalist, uh, Teambux is becoming quite popular for people sharing uh, Vim sessions and other shell sessions. Um, a lot of people will use this uh, in combination with other screen sharing technologies. But I do want to pause for a rant. An intriguing thing I've found is, is a lot of people who I talk to about remote pairing who say that they do remote pairing, uh, but they happen to not work for us, Pivotal Labs, who has sort of developed this, these techniques you're seeing in this, this slide deck. A lot of them use read-only screen sharing sessions. Uh, this might be because they're primarily doing chatting on Skype, and Skype allows you to share a read-only version of your workspace very easily. And I really want to encourage people to use screen sharing technologies that allow two-way editing. Uh, I don't believe you get the full benefit of pairing uh, remotely if you're handcuffing half of your team and preventing them from being able to edit. Inevitably, there's going to be times when uh, the host, who has full editing uh, rights, is going to get stuck or confused or not sure what to do, and the other pair is going to not be stuck. They're going to be ready to jump in, start coding. They understand what the problem is. They understand how to, how to convey the solution, how to type it. Uh, and th instead of being able to do that, they'll be locked out of that editing and be forced to just use a you know, phone call style you know, dis descriptions of what the solutions are. Open up your, your screen sharing sessions. Let people edit. Uh, let them have the full pairing experience. Next, video conferencing. A lot of the usual suspects here. Skype, of course, is the most popular. Um, iChat uh, for Mac is popular as well. Uh, Google has um, built-in stuff into Gmail. Google Talk, for example, uh, is popular. Uh, in our experience, Skype seems to have the highest quality of uh, voice and video, but if you can get away with it, use the old one the 2.x versions. Skype 5.0 is an incarnation of the devil. Something that's, at, the, at least at the time of this recording, uh, that's new on the scene is Google Plus with Google Hangouts. And we've been trying this, and I've found that once you get your team into one of these uh, Google Hangout sessions, uh, with uh, you know three or four different video sessions going at the same time, I find that it's better than Skype 5, at least at the time of this recording. The challenge is actually the model that Google has for inviting people into these Hangouts. How do you get everybody connected? That's actually quite a challenge. If somebody uh, drops out, how do they jo rejoin? That's definitely challenging. Uh, really awkward user interaction model there. But once everybody's in, it's pretty good. Uh, stay tuned on this one. I wouldn't go so far as to recommend it, but we're still playing with it, and I'm sure that Google's going to make some uh, improvements. My desk. You saw my setup a little bit earlier. Uh, let's look at it in a little bit more detail. So here's my setup, my daily setup. 
uh, computer, of course. Uh, what you're seeing on the screen there is not my local desktop. That is a remote desktop uh, with my pair who's about 2,500 miles away. Quick note on screen size here. It's important uh, if you can to have both pairs have, even if they don't have the same computer, which is ideal, having exactly the same computer is, is great, uh, but at least have monitors that are the same size. Uh, if one person is on a 27 inch monitor and somebody else is on a 13 inch monitor, maybe on a laptop, then one of those pairs is either going to have to scale their screen way, way up, and, or the other one's going to have to scale theirs down a, a lot. Uh, that's just going to sort of hinder the pairing experience. Uh, having monitors of equal sizes uh, really makes it smoother. Uh, external microphone, this is a Snowball Blue mic, uh, or Blue Snowball, um, and also high quality external speakers. Uh, a lot of people use headphones all day, and I'll talk about headphones here in a sec, but I happen to have an office where, uh, a home office, where I'm not going to be disturbing anybody if there's speaker noise, or if I'm talking all day. So I use this high quality mic and high quality speakers to allow me to uh, to pair remotely without having to wear headphones all day. Talked quite a bit about laptops. Uh, even if the computer you see here is fully capable of hosting the video conferencing session, it's kind of nice to offload that onto an, ex an extra machine. Just less things to worry about on the pairing station. Uh, you offload a bit of the CPU burden as well. That's not as big a deal, but it's just nice to be able to uh, completely deal with the audio video part uh, separately from the pairing station, figuring out where to put the, the screen, um, things like that, or the video screen. I want to talk about headphones for a moment. You might think, you know, pretty much all video headsets are the same, no big deal. Um, I really encourage everybody to find the ones that work best for you, especially from a comfort level. Um, I've gone through many different sets of headphones. Uh, I wear them if I, my ears become sore from the, the ear cuffs you know, within an hour, then I return them. I don't hesitate on that. Um, if you're going to be wearing something on your head for eight hours a day, uh, five days a week, you want it to be as comfortable as possible. might mean you have to spend a couple hundred bucks, but uh, find something that works good for you. It's a really good investment. That's pretty much it for me. Um, again, my name is Joe Moore. Um, I have a survey I'd love everybody to fill out. It's one question. Uh, I'd love to be able to uh, make this presentation better over time. Uh, feel free to hit me up on Twitter or send me an email if you have any questions or comments. Thank you.